And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. That's right, Greta, you pint-sized antagonist. It is Friday, and this is our own personal Friday protest. Now under a new a name, the Climate Reality Show or Climate Realism Show, episode 103, Climate the Movie. Yes, there was a big movie released this week, and we're going to talk about that. It's, uh, for lack of a better word, it's an epic. So I'm your host, Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute. Joining me today, we have a regular panelist, Dr. H. Sterling Burnett, of the director of the Robinson Center. Uh, Linnea Lucan, a Robinson Center Research Fellow, and special guest Tom Nelson, longtime blogger, longtime climate skeptic, uh, Twitter twit extraordinaire, and producer of the climate movie. Welcome, guys. Thank well, you very much, Anthony. Good to be back, Anthony. Oh, yeah. So anyway, we're going to get to the main topic, which is the climate, climate the movie in just a few minutes. But first, we're going to do our usual thing where we talk about crazy climate news of the week. Some of the nuttiest, eye-rolling, eye-watering, you've got to be freaking kidding me stuff that you can find on the internet. And we got a boatload of it this week. First of all, this one's a real winner. I mean, is there nothing that climate change can't do? Chocolate Easter eggs have risen in price by more than 50% in the United Kingdom. And scientists, the top scientists, say that climate change is to blame. Mm. I mean, really? Seriously? Uh, it's interesting. Hold on, that... hold on. Climate psychosis is what this is. El Nino was seen as responsible for West Africa's uh, ongoing drought, where there, a lot of the, the chocolate, is raised, uh, chocolate beans are grown. But new research by the world's top climate scientists or, you know, top men say, no, climate change is to blame, leading to higher chocolate Easter egg prices. Uh, I haven't checked Easter egg prices here in the U.S. yet, uh, but I suspect they're also higher because I uh, everything is here with inflation. Um, but I have checked the U.N.'s data on cocoa beans. And they show record-setting cocoa production. So that can't be the problem, the, the reason for the cost of Easter eggs rise. It's not a lack of cocoa. It's not a lack of chocolate production, uh, unless cocoa is going to something else. Uh, it, it's, it's other things. Yeah, it's just nuts. I mean... Cocoa bean production has consistently and significantly increased over the short term and the long term. You can see this in the data. But, you know, we've got Biden-driven inflation in the United States and similar policies going on in Europe and the UK. And these are responsible for the price increases, not climate change. Yeah. Well, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Um, we've covered the... Uh claims about cocoa being impacted by climate change several times. Cocoa, of course, is one of those crops that tends to grow uh, best in the tropics where it's already pretty hot. So um, not too worried about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, that's the whole maxim that everyone should say about climate change alarmism. I'm not too worried about it because most of it like this is complete hype with no basis in reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, good Goodness. Anyway. All right. So it's not just this, you know, that the Easter eggs are going up in price caused by climate change. We've got something even crazier. Yes. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. Yeah, the AP coverage of climate red alert is nothing more than a red herring. I can tell you this for sure. The, the 
the UN World Meteorological Organization decided we're going to issue a red alert on climate change. Whoop, 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 whoop. And, you know, it's just nuts. And here's why. If we go to our rebuttal on it that was published this week in Climate Realism, you'll find that the data doesn't support it. They're talking about the fact that 2023 was the hottest ever. And El Nino was the responsible party. So Jim, if we could switch to the rebuttal uh, link that we have there, uh, the show, the climate realism, there we go. Thank you very much. And scroll down just a little bit. Got an interesting graph I wanna show you. Um, it, uh, it's a graph showing the El Nino, La Nina conditions right there. Now, this is from the same day that the WMO issued their red alert. Now, here's the interesting part. The area in the Pacific known as 3.4, Nino 3.4, is the accepted metric area for El Nino measurement. And NOAA tracks this on a daily basis. It had already started down starting in November, and it continues to go down. And the projection far into the future for next year in 2024 says, it's going to be even further down, 4.2 degrees centigrade lower than the peak. And yet the people over at the WMO are claiming we have a red alert because 2024 is going to be another record hot year. Mm -hmm. I don't see it happening. What do you guys think? I don't have much to say. The facts speak for themselves. Uh, the WMO went off the reservation once again uh, to hype climate fears over climate facts. Yeah, I don't know. It just strikes me as another one of those things, kind of like the doomsday clock, where it's just a bunch of random nerds moving the hand a little bit and being like, ooh, watch out. This time we're really serious about it. Um, exactly. We really mean but once it. again, <laughs> not too worried. Yeah, it just, uh, you know, anytime there's an opportunity for the media to... Um, Basically, take some simple thing and blow it up. They're going to do it. Tom, you know, Tom knows a little bit about this. Maybe he'd like to weigh in. Say again about, uh, me about media blowing things up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know a lot about that. I've been uh, looking at that online for uh, since 2006. So, yeah, they always, are, of course, are doing that on everything. And uh, they, they never fail to do that. Right. All right. So let's go on to our next crazy climate news of the week. Hertz, I, I don't normally like running CNN post, but their headline was great. <laughs> Hertz CEO is out following electric car horror show. Yes, indeedy. They are getting rid of some 20,000 of their fleet of electric Teslas that nobody wants to drive. Why? Because what happens is they take them out of the Hertz dealership off on a trip and they get stranded because the average person doesn't understand range anxiety. They don't understand how to find charging stations and so forth and so on. And so it's been an unmitigated disaster. And so the CEO who said, this is what we need to do is out. Uh, now he resigned. And I don't think, think of this as a climate crazy. I think of this as a climate comforting story. All right. Uh, it, it comforts my soul to know that there are consequences <laughs> when you do stupid, stupid things like a rental car company buying a lot of electric vehicles and, and thinking people will do well with them. I know how I've driven rental cars. I drive a lot of miles when I have a rental car because I'm on a trip. And uh, I'd spend most of my time charging if, if, if all I did was drive an electric vehicle. But the other problem that Hertz faced, and this is almost or as more important than their, uh, you know, driver reluctance. Hertz and all these rental car companies make a lot of money when they resell their rental cars after just two or three years. Nobody wants to buy a used EV yeah. because the battery packs are so expensive to replace. And if you're using them for Hertz and they've already put a lot of miles on them, you can expect those battery packs to go out real soon. Yep. In fact, there's a story uh, in our one of our EV graphics links, the second one, that shows that... Um, there's a story about the fact that EVs simply are not selling. They're, they're not, the used EVs are not selling. No, I, I, the, only one, the only reason I'd want to use EV is to have it in my uh, 
you know, parked in front of my house and people will think, oh, he's cool. He, he really cares. You know, I, I do my own little virtue signaling. Every so often I'd take, uh, if I had an EV, I'd have like a Rivian truck. And so they look cool. Uh, I, I wouldn't go, you know, past the grocery store with it, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the environmental costs that are hidden inside of EVs, people generally don't know about this. You know, and of course, the left, they never talk about it because EVs are the salvation of the planet from carbon dioxide. But the bottom line is, is that there's a huge amount of a carbon footprint in the manufacturer of these things. Huge amounts that's hidden. And so the, the net result is that these things aren't saving much carbon dioxide, if any at all. Because of all the, the energy that went into production, all the mining that went into production, and manufacturing, all of this stuff that used up energy and resources and produced CO2 in the process, these things are not net zero. That's the basic way to look at them. Right. Well, of course not. I mean, I'm very few things actually are net zero, uh, especially when it comes to green technology. I can't think of any of it, especially when it's dealing with or when it depends on so many... Um, advanced materials, you know, cause these things aren't produced, you know, out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it takes a lot of effort to, to make, especially, you know, all the battery components, all the electronic components, the more computers you put in the car, the more complex it is, the more things break and you have to repair them and <laughs> they go wrong. Um, so I don't know. I, it's, it's very, suspicious that these things get pushed so hard when one they're not popular outside of a certain demographic of people who like to you know either virtue signal about it or they're just trying it out because they've heard that it's really good and they want to give it a chance and they do and then they don't buy another one usually uh, according to the statistics that we've been able to dig up on it so yeah it's um it's very odd that they push it so hard as yeah. you know, I, I wasn't here last week, right? I was on vacation and I drove, uh, it turns out, a little over 3,000 miles on my trip. I, I drove straight through to Tennessee. I made it in 11 hours and uh, 45 minutes from where I was going. Uh, that trip, the trip would have taken me two to three days uh, in an electric vehicle because I would have had stuff to charge. All right. Uh, likely overnight. So my entire vacation would have been taken up with the travel. Um, when I was in Tennessee, I, I put hundreds of miles on the car almost every day, going to state parks, uh, caves, things like that, that that I like to do, that my wife and I like to do. I, I saw one Bucky's in the entire state of Tennessee. It was right outside of Crossville, Tennessee. The largest thing I've ever seen in my life, the largest gas station I've ever seen in my life. It had, uh, I, I, when I put gas in, it was, I was on pump 257. That tells you how many gas pumps it had. It also had a long row of electric vehicle chargers. And there was one lonely, lonely person over there in that row of electric vehicle chargers charging his, his Tesla. Uh, while Literally hundreds of people were, were filling their cars up and he was still there when I, when I left, uh, he was there when I got there, he was there when I left. Uh, and, uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it is. You know, and I think the solution to this problem is to make charging stations vacation destinations, <laughs> you know? They put a pool in there, you know, in a hotel and so forth. And well, you make the you make the charger location uh, a destination where you can stay at for a whole day or so while the vehicle waits in line and then gets charged. To be fair, that Bucky's could have been. It was like a, an indoor shopping mall when I went in. Restaurants and foods and clothes. That guy could have camped out. He they had camping gear, so he probably could have camped out there. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. All right. So the next crazy climate thing is Tell us, this is from the New York Times. How has the climate crisis affected your relationship 
Uh, well, actually, that's the second one, but we can talk about that. Can, but it's equally absurd. Can climate cafes ease the anxiety of the planetary crisis? Yes, let's go down to the local coffee shop and whine about climate change over a cup of coffee. Oh, the horror. You know, it would. It, it's like a scene from Friends, uh, you know, where they're just whining and bitching about everything in the coffee shop. Well, I have, I have two things about this. First, I have absolutely no doubt that the way that climate is promoted in the media um, has actually like mentally damaged people who are easily mentally damaged by scary stories <laughs> in the news. Uh, so I, I'm not skeptical at all that this is something that some people feel like they need. Um, I also am confused as to why why there's a there's a need for like a structured organization to do this when they get to have these little like fear sessions whenever they feel like it on the news and on social media and everywhere else all the time <laughs> anyway um but I guess it's just another way to make some money off of the climate thing. So I, I thought we had climate cafes. Weren't they called the rain? Aren't they called rainforest? Rainforest cafe. cafe? <laughs> uh, I mean, I would think I would think that if you were really worried about climate anxiety, you wouldn't have a climate cafe. What you'd have is sort of a um, Bobby McFerrin, "Don't worry, be happy" cafe, and uh, you come in and. Uh, all the, you know, it's all bright and sunny and you have uh, uh, people singing Be Happy in the background on video and and uh, you, you, you can't leave the cafe not feeling better, regardless of what's going on outside the world. Yeah. Right. Well, it's uh, it, yeah, the the section that has been highlighted here is, man, this whole article is just really a bummer. <laughs> it's really yeah. sad. Oh, well, man. Well, what I don't understand is. They're pushing a climate cafe, you know, a coffee shop. But at the same time, they're telling us coffee's going to disappear due to climate change. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right now, now that if that were a fact, I mean, I wrote about that this week. If that were a fact, that would induce anxiety in me. Yeah, right, and a bunch of other people. All right, I'll find our final one, also from the New York Times, where they're talking about how the climate crisis has affected relationships. I don't know. You know, are people that lame? Seriously? Of course, this, oh, I'm sorry. This is from The Guardian, not The New York Times. My mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but the, really, are you that lame? Is Are you so worried about climate change that it affects your ability to have a happy relationship with your wife, your girlfriend, whatever, your friends? I mean, what the hell? Think about this generation of snowflakes. Their relationships are affected by whether they use the right pronouns. Yeah, that's uh, true. You know, I mean, these are people that sit around going, oh, well, did I, should I split the the, the bill or not? Um, does this count as a date? Ooh, is this a he or she or they or them? You know, they've got anxiety about everything. And it's induced by themselves, constantly worrying about the, most idiotic things, climate change being among those idiotic things to worry about. Yes. And for the rational people of the world, that always comes in dead last in all the polls. Yeah. It always yeah. does. Well, you know, there, it, it, it's it's no coincidence that when they measure um, happiness and feelings of well-being in the U.S., generally Republicans who are more skeptical are happier than Democrats who are more woke. They worry about every little thing and it distresses them. Whereas Republicans have families and children and they take pride and joy in that and don't worry about every little just stupid thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's it just sad that so many people let this, let the media twist them into angst and worry to the point where it's affecting their relationships, um, and affecting their mental health. I mean, the media is complicit at causing people to be afraid, causing children to be afraid. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's almost child abuse, making a child think that he or she has no future because of climate change. It's, it's really 
Do you guys oh, think? Do you guys think that if our if our audience submitted uh, earnest responses to this form, that the Guardian would publish them? I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> nice jim uh so yeah if you you know maybe uh to the audience if you want to fill out this thing the guardian is asking for contributions what how climate change has affected your relationship you can fill it out please be nice <laughs> no curse words please but um please give them your earnest uh, response to how this has impacted your relationship and i'm sure that they will absolutely definitely publish it yeah it's it certainly <laughs> made my late spring early early i mean early Jim. spring late fall vacations <laughs> better with my wife uh we, we weren't snowed out of anything the roads weren't clogged uh we didn't wreck so uh yeah. it's, it's boosted me jim you should upload a picture of al gore and chipper right there <laughs> 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 well, th theirs did fall apart, but I have a feeling it wasn't climate change. Yeah, because I, I truly, their relationship was affected by climate change because Al went nuts. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Let's go to some cartoons. Finally, some wind power that I really, really like. I mean, this is brilliant. Whoever came up with this one, look at that. It's just like the World War II airplanes oh, are fighting the Japanese. Is that awesome or what? <laughs> oh. Eagle. I wonder if those are... Look at all the birds and eagles. I was about to say, are they eagles or California condors on there? Yeah, yeah it looks like eagles. Nice. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. The flying then, tiger. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the next one is really kind of sad, but it's true. It's the new world order is headed as, at us like a freight train, but most of society is busy taking Barbie type selfies out there. They're not paying attention to what's happening. We are, they are not. I feel All called right. out by this one. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I can't even stand to take selfies of myself. All right, so let's talk about our main topic, climate the movie. Now, this has been in the works for quite some time, and it was just released this week. Uh, this movie is is free to view. It is um, a fantastic uh, compendium of all of the different topics associated with climate alarmism and the rebuttals built back in. You would have to be bra completely brainwashed and hope and beyond hope of recovery if you watch this and you couldn't see what was really going on. So Tom Nelson is one of the producers of this particular movie, and he's with us today. Um, what I want to do first is run a little bit of the, the show, of the movie, and then, Tom, you can jump in and start telling us about it and answer viewer questions and so forth and so on. So let's roll and see what we've got. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. These are climate are protesters, the by the way. A mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! This is the story of how an eccentric environmental scare grew into a powerful global industry. It's a wonderful business opportunity, okay? You want climate, we'll give you climate. There's a huge amount of money involved. This is a huge, big money scam. There are not just now billions, but there are trillions of dollars at stake. It's a story of self-interest and big government funding. People like me, our careers depend on funding of climate research. This is what I've been doing just about my whole career. This is what the other climate researchers are doing with their whole career. They don't want this to end. If CO2 isn't having the huge negative impacts that we claimed it was having originally, how are we going to stay in business? A lot of people's livelihoods depend on it. They're not gonna give that up. This is a story of the corruption of science. There's no such thing as a climate emergency happening on this planet now. It's, there's no, no evidence of one. The climate alarm is nonsense, you know, it's, it's a hoax. I've never liked hoax. I, I think scam is a better word, but I'm willing to live with hoax. 
It's a story about the bullying and intimidation of anyone who dares to challenge the climate alarm. To speak up against or about climate change in any sort of skeptical way was essentially career suicide. Activists are even calling for any skepticism to be criminalized. It's the story of an assault on individual freedom. It's a wonderful way to uh, increase government power. If there's an existential threat out there that's worldwide, well, you need a powerful worldwide government, you know, to cope with it. We see all these kind of uh, authoritarian measures being adopted in the name of saving the planet. You've suddenly got the population under control all over the world. Yep. Climate the movie, the cold truth. I want to mention that if you're searching for the topic on YouTube, just put in climate the movie. The cold truth is not in the YouTube title, and so it doesn't show up if you search for that whole phrase. So, Tom, what got all of this started? What was the impetus behind this? Where was the idea put together and when? Yeah, it was interesting for me because I started a podcast in 2022, and I think my guest number 20 was Martin Durkin. And I just had him on because I was a huge fan of the great global warming swindle that he did back in 2007. I wanted to hear about mm -hmm. that. And just out of the blue, uh, partway through that podcast, uh, he volunteered that he would really like to remake it because he didn't have a lot of, t a lot of time to make that one. He thought he could do a better job if he, he could do it again. So that just kind of kicked it off right there. And uh, a few months later, he actually started making the movie. It took him almost exactly one year uh, from when he started until now, till the movie is out. And I think he just did a fantastic job. I think he was exactly the right person to make this movie at the right time. So I'm really happy with how this came out. And it's already getting some uh, really good uh, viewership uh, online everywhere right now. Yeah. And, you know, having taken down Al Gore and his ridiculous claims in 2007, he was already primed for this. So it was, yeah, like you say, he was the perfect person to do it. A full disclosure, I was supposed to be on this movie, and then something happened, and, and I didn't get any more communications. Well, it turned out uh, all the emails from Mr. Durkin were going into my spam folder, and so I missed that opportunity. Uh, otherwise, I would have been in the movie. But, um, you know, the movie, what have been some of the initial reactions, good and bad, to the movie? Uh, it's interesting. I, I had a lot of reactions because I actually I did a tour as we did premieres around the world or in three different spots. Uh, it premiered in London and then it went to the Netherlands and then back in the Washington, D.C. area. And just the uh, feedback, uh, of course, the people that were attending were not uh, alarmists, but a very, very uh, positive. Uh, a lot of people said that uh, this is the way this is the type of movie that you can show to people who haven't really been into it. Uh, they believe in it casually, but they've never looked at the evidence at all. I think it's a perfect movie for people like that. If they can spend 80 minutes and uh, watch, uh, uh, look at the graphs, et cetera, they can find out that everything they're worried about, uh, they should not be worried about at all. And then one other thing we're going to do, I'm working on that right now, is to break it up into pieces, uh, 10, 20 second pieces of a different um, key quotes from different people. There's great quotes in there all the way through from like uh, Nobel Prize winner John Clauser is in there talking uh, in, uh, very uh, openly about how this is just a crock. There's, there's nothing to the alarmism at all. So yeah, the feedback has been really good uh, all the way around. And I'm interested to see how much we're going to get attacked because I think we are going to get attacked. Uh, by uh, the media, but uh, they haven't had time yet. But those attacks must be coming pretty soon, I would think. Yeah, have you had any personal attacks on Twitter or email or anything about this movie? You know, not more than usual, maybe. I get just enormous amounts of attacks. Uh, yeah, just tons and tons of them, but uh, nothing unusual, kind of the same. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to leave uh, uh, questions open to our panelists and see if Sterling or Linnea have anything to talk about with Tom. Well, I mean, obviously the the production value and everything was fantastic. I thought it was really entertaining. It was, it felt really short for how long it was. It's just fun to watch all the way through. So big kudos for making such a dynamic and interesting um, documentary to watch, you know, because that's not always easy to do. Yeah, I think Martin Durkin is just incredibly good at that because he's done so many of them. I think he's done 100 documentaries. He's been in the business wow. a long time and he's just learned a lot as time has gone on. And yeah, I think he does a great job. Uh, you could tell, you could put up the same graphs and tell the same story in a way more uh, boring manner. So uh, he uses all these different camera angles and he uses uh, all sorts of archival footage of the Romans racing around. And uh, I think Charlie Chaplin is in there and he just, uh, he's got a good sense of humor. I think 
he's really the, the right guy to do it because he understands what's happening with the, the whole climate scam and he knows how to make a, a good film about it. So uh, I really yeah. give him a lot of credit for doing a good job here. That stock footage that's inserted at appropriate places is just really good comic relief. It really mm -hmm. is. Yeah, he's got dinosaurs. Saw, Go ahead. When I saw the film, I just, at the end, I thought the, the, the proper title for this film is Climate Crisis colon Case Closed. I don't know how anyone could view this film with an open mind, not not with coming in with firmly set preconceptions and say, you know what? I'm still worried about climate change. We've got to we've got to have big government to solve this problem. Yeah, I think that's a great point. If they have an open mind, it's going to really shift people. But uh, of course, uh, Michael Mann or whatever, people like that who are all in their whole career is based on this. They're not going to change uh, no matter what. But I think for yeah. a good percentage of the people, this will make a difference. But we'll find out. Right. This is going to reach the, the people in the middle ground that aren't sure. Um, you know, people like ourselves, we understand what's going on and we understand that climate is not a crisis. We understand that a little bit of temperature rise over the past hundred years is manageable and adaptable. We get all of that. On the other side of the equation, the, 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 the manites are like, oh my God, we got to do something and the world's burning, you know, and they're just total full tilt nuts over it's this thinking that. There's danger out there. And then there's the people in the middle looking at both sides, trying to go, uh, you know, is it really that bad or is it not that bad at all? It's worse so than that. This is going to reach Manites. those people. It's worse than that for the Manites. They don't just say, oh, my God, the world is ending. We got to do something. They say, oh, my God, the world is ending. And because it's ending, it's an emergency and we've got to suspend freedoms and we must shut down anyone who disputes what we're saying. And that comes out very well in the film. Yeah. Yeah, it really is about, uh, it's really a political tool more than anything. Uh, one thing I enjoyed in going to all of these premieres is that I talked to a number of people who went with like a significant other. It was like a, a spouse or something, and they were not into the debate at all. And I talked to them and they were saying, you know, I never, I never really uh, listened to uh listen to the arguments before and it made a difference for me now i can understand why uh, my spouse is uh, so uh, fighting back at this so hard so that made me real, real happy to hear stuff like that well we Great. have some we have some questions from the audience for you uh first up is from jacob he says was there a reason not to include a few minutes of the infamous data tampering or the homogenization scandal yeah. That's a great question. We're getting all sorts of questions like that. And the, the major answer is there's only 80 minutes and it's, you'd like to cover everything. Somebody wanted uh, all sorts of coverage on Milankovitch cycles. One guy wanted 80 minutes just on data tampering, but you got 80 minutes and you can't, <laughs> it can't be 800 minutes. So yeah, we had to leave out enormous amounts of stuff. And uh, yeah, I think he, uh, Martin gets the credit for figuring out what to put in there. I think he did a good job of uh, putting in uh, a good 80 minutes. And besides and, uh, that, homogenization is a tough topic for the general public to understand they don't get that and they don't they think oh well we just measure the temperature of the earth and it's getting warmer and it's that simple they have a clue after the complexity of all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes with creating that data measuring the data and the problems with measuring the data that i have outlined for years by the fact that you know over 90 percent of the stations in the united states used to measure climate change have corrupted locations and you know it people just don't get that it's too complex sometimes so, and, for a movie. anthony i hope you like the part about the urban heat island i think that was a very good part uh, showing like a map of paris and how much warmer it is in the center of paris versus the outskirts of paris i think that's uh, something that ordinary people can easily grasp and i think yeah uh, it was well did. done mm -hmm. i liked it mm -hmm. the whole well, section have... you had different people talking about yeah. it coming at it from different perspectives I'm sorry, Linnea. Was no, you're good. I was just going to say we have another question from Jim, which is what kind of reception has the movie received in its premieres, which have been held in the U.S. and Europe? Yeah, the receptions were uh, great. Super heartwarming for me as being involved in it. Uh, over in, we had a full house of 300 people in London. And uh, yeah, each time we would have the movie premiere and then we would uh, have a couple hours to talk to people at least afterwards. And reception was absolutely thumbs up. Uh, it, it made me very happy. Then we went on to the Netherlands and they had 571 people there, just a, a big theater, just full of people. And uh, then we had a big Q and A after that one and all sorts of really good questions came in. But again, it was heartwarming for me. And then the DC one, same thing. We had a, a smaller group of people, but uh, 
over and over, people said this is the right movie and uh, this is what we needed at this time. A lot of people keep saying this is the right time because so many people are waking up for, for other reasons. And I think that's a big factor that a lot of people were saying five years ago, I kind of believed everything the media said. And uh, now with the yeah. medical, yeah, all these things, they've been for Perfect. sure, they've been lying to us. And the whole question is, what else are they lying to us about? And clearly, as people look into this, they find out they're lying to us here, too. Is, yeah, um, you know. Now I can say with with impunity that Michael Mann is the Anthony Fossey of climate change. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you mentioned the the turnout. I know we had uh, John Clauser, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, at the CP turnout. Uh, the joys of live podcasting. Um, do you find that your audience are all people, you know, are, are we preaching to the choir with the audience that you had show up or did you have some people come in? Um, do, you, do you think that that sort of were just people that wanted to loan more? You know, I would say that most of the people that would take the time to go to the premiere were people that already knew that uh, it, that's a scam. I would say, like I was saying, there were some spouses and stuff, but uh, I think where it's really going to make a difference is online now that uh, already I'm seeing all sorts of people saying that uh, they're showing it to their kids, et cetera, and all sorts of people um, in an online world. It's a lot easier to just quickly click on it instead of actually physically going to some premiere someplace. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, so Tom, I have a question for you. That, that uh, treadmill behind you, is that where you elevate your CO2 footprint? That is, that is where I do that. Yeah. It's been sitting back there for a long time. I think I got <laughs> 12,000 miles on it so far. Well, I have another one from the uh, audience here. So what can the people who will be attacking you guys over this, uh, what can they actually say, really, when confronted with the evidence here? Yeah, it's all the same thing that we've all heard every single time. They're not going to really go after the evidence. It's all about, oh, you're funded by big oil and maybe you hate your kids. The only reason you don't believe is because <laughs> you're going to be dead pretty soon and you're not going to see the climate crisis, which is kind of weird because we're supposed to be experiencing the climate crisis right now. But then, uh, uh, yeah, it's all the same old stuff. Um, there's been a lot of uh, trolls on Twitter making those type of arguments, but I haven't seen uh, anybody take on the evidence because you can't. I mean, it's a slam dunk. If you actually look at the evidence, uh, there's no way that you can look at all that evidence and say CO2 is causing bad weather. There's a Earth is too hot. All of those things, of course, are just uh, totally ridiculous. I can't believe that this whole thing has lasted as long as it has. Uh, Richard Lindzen told me that himself. He thought that right. this would have died off a long time ago. It's completely well, crazy it lasted so long. The reason oh, is it's just, it just like at Watergate, you know, follow the money. The money has been driving this, you know, research and whole research empires have been built up, mm -hmm. you know, chasing this climate change crisis. And, you know, if the money dried up, the problem would dry up. Well, the problem's not there. But my point is, is that the the as an issue mode is perpetuated by the money. Yeah, as an issue, it would go away if the money dried up. Uh, you know, I think the the film explored that very well. Um, my suspicion is I haven't uh, gone back and looked at climate funding data inter internationally or nationally. But my suspicion is we spent more on climate research in the last 10 years, maybe 15 years, than we spent cumulatively on climate research throughout history. Um, and, uh, you know, way back in 50, no, in 60, in 60, I think, 59 or 60, when Eisenhower did his uh, farewell address and he warned of the military industrial complex, he also warned of the science industrial complex, of the science government complex, that that once science is funding big stuff, big stuff's going to go where climate, where uh, where government wants it to go, which is going to be crisis, which is going to be bigger government, and that's what's happened. And uh, you explore that very well in the film, I think. Yeah, I do see this thing, uh, as Martin says too, that this is kind of a war. It is a war on the working class. It's people who are uh, at the top. They want power and money and the people who are paying for all this stuff and getting the short end of everything are the working people. So I'm con I'm happy that the working people are protesting in various countries around the world and pushing back against this thing. I think that's, that's going to snowball. And I actually do see the whole thing crumbling pretty soon. And I talked to Mark Morano just uh, recently on his podcast. He thinks this is going to last 10 more years, maybe. I do not think it's going to, but we'll find out. Do you... Um... 
you know, you mentioned some of the things that they're raising against it, and it's never about the data. One of the things you really took on quite well, I think, in the film was the old idea of consensus. Oh, the consensus. And it shows how the consensus has been built by suppressing other people's voices, getting them out of the careers, things like that. Have have people tried to raise consensus arguments against you? Or the, did they say, well, we're not going to touch that because he addresses it pretty well in the film? No, I mean, the people who are all on, on consensus. They don't care about any arguments. So, yeah, that is still being raised. But uh, for normal people, again, with open minds, if they listen to Ross McKittrick talk about this, about how consensus is uh, manufactured, that if they throw out everybody who disagrees, then everybody who is left agrees. And so we must be right. He does a great job of explaining that. So, yeah, it's all about reaching people, like Anthony said, in the middle. And I, I, this will do that, I believe. So here's another <laughs> question. <laughs> How's life as a movie star? It's really similar to how it was three weeks ago. I would say it's exactly <laughs> the same so far. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to. Then... I want to ask a very obvious question before anyone else does. How much big oil money was used to produce this? Uh, zero dollars and zero cents. Absolutely nothing. And just for me personally, my entire time of everything I've been doing for seventeen years, I have not made one cent from anybody. So it's uh, yeah. Raise, raise your yeah. hand, everybody, if you've gotten money from big oil. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I keep hoping. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's another one. Um, is there a list of data sources we can view? Uh, we have not put that together yet. A lot of people are asking for that. And uh, we there might be a separate website. I don't want to make a climate the movie .net, uh, that as uh, the site to go to. I, I don't have time to maintain that. But somehow I, I think it's going to happen. But we are going to have to crowdsource some of this for sure so oh. if whoever wants to do some of that uh, we can point you towards uh, your website but we do need a lot of help from people to get this done because it's basically uh, it's either me or martin that has to do it martin's not going to do it so then it's just me kind of so we need yeah. some help for that in the meantime uh if you're looking for facts about these topics some of them that have been discussed in this movie you can go to climate at a glance.com we have a complete repertoire of these things, many of which were covered in the movie. So climateataglance.com can help explain a lot of this. Boy, that was clean, Anthony. <laughs> that was good. Okay, so... Uh, and we have movie... a new app. And we yeah, have a that's new Climate true. at a Glance <laughs> app. <laughs> we have an app, too. Um, does the movie address Greta's claim that we're at the beginning of a mass extinction? Um, it doesn't talk about... It doesn't talk about extinction at all, just because if you look at the data, I mean, the weather is not getting any worse. Uh, warmer is better. There's absolutely nothing that indicates anywhere that CO2 is causing any extinctions. That's just completely crazy. That's way off the rails. And uh, yeah. yeah, there's no yeah, reason. There's, I mean, there is no mass extinction. I mean, there's no news stories about, you know, the elephants haven't disappeared. The giraffes haven't disappeared. You know, the condors haven't disappeared. And they're, they're you know, they were close to extinction at one point, but they were brought back by the actions of humanity, right? So yeah. where's the extinctions? There are none. Well, I think most of the extinction that they talk about is in kind of like, um, not not like macro land animals, but like, tiny little things like bugs and stuff. Bacteria. The thing is, the thing is with the extinction claims, to the extent that I some extinctions have increased, this morning. to the extent that ex extinctions have increased, it is it's it is due to human actions, but it's due to land use changes. You, you change habitats. However, we don't know within two or three orders of magnitude how many species exist. And we don't know within two or three orders of magnitude how many species are or have gone extinct in the past. We, we basically make up numbers based on models. Uh, and we know how reliable these kinds of models, island biogeography models is what they normally work with. And they don't work very well on, <laughs> on islands. Yeah. So uh, one I want thing I want to say that RCP 8.5 is America's top model. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about extinction, actually, we did mention it in the sense of that maybe at 180 ppm, we're starting to get to the point where in some places, uh, plants, uh, especially at high elevations, they start to uh, starve. And uh, so we're way closer, of course, to having too little CO2 than having too much because uh, we had thousands of ppm CO2, everything was fine. But if we were to cut CO2 even in half from here, that would be uh, that would be tough on life. And uh, so uh, Patrick Moore makes it he, he uh, articulates that very well in this movie. Well, indeed, you know, the greening of the earth due to CO2 is expanding uh, and that can't be anything but good for species. 
So Same we have. Question. Yep, ahead. we have this one. Uh, can I ask if the film will be coming out on DVD? This film will go perfectly with my copy of The Great Global Warming Swindle. Okay, as far as I know, I'm sorry to say it's not. Just uh, as we asked around, it seemed like DVD sales have really gone down even in the, in the last year or two. So uh, we decided not to do that. But if I but maybe the, we'll I change will say hmm? the advantage of having a DVD is that it doesn't disappear. I mean, you can be on oh. YouTube and someday, you know, one day they say, yep, gone. Yeah. You can't, you can't be suppressed if you're on DVD. Yep. Uh, one good point, though, that that brings up with Anthony, Anthony said is we're fully prepared. Maybe they're going to try to censor the movie and take it down in, in one or two places or something. But already it's, it's I'm so happy that it's spreading out so much that all sorts of people have uh, already downloaded a full copy of the movie. So uh, tons of people have it in their house already. I have it already on USB. It's backed up all over the place and it's already online over the all over the place. It's on, right. I don't know what, 17 cool. different places. So it's going to be really hard for people to scrub it from the internet, even though they might want to. Right. So my question is about this. This is free to share, free to post, free to view. There is no licensing restrictions of any kind on this, right? Correct. Yep. Everybody can do, yeah, whatever you want to do, chop it up all you want and uh, you know, put little pieces up anywhere, well, whatever you want well, to do. Let me add a caveat to that. You can chop it up, but don't put words in people's mouth and make it into something that it isn't. Right, right. I mean, please don't do that, but uh, use what's <laughs> there. Use what's there any way you want because... Uh, we want it right. to spread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next question. This is from our friend, uh, Doug Pollock. Uh, Tom, are you afraid that this great documentary will be censored in the West? Yeah, like we were just saying, uh, I think they're going to try, but I don't see how they're going to succeed. But I guess we'll find out. And there is some chance that it could even make the movie more popular if it gets censored, because that did happen, I think, to Planet of the Humans when Michael Moore came out with that. They tried to censor it, and I think it got way more publicity, and it, uh, it helped it a lot. If, when yeah, that the Streisand effect. Yeah, yeah, could happen. Right. Okay, we have this question, which is, I think, a little bit sarcastic, but we're going to put it up anyway. Okay, a question in three parts. Part one, how long has the planet Earth had a climate? Part two, how long has climate changed? Part three, if it was changing before humans existed, then what on Earth was causing it? Okay, uh, over four four 4.6 billion years. Is that the correct answer, Anthony? He knows. I don't know. But yeah. Great question. Of course, it was changing all the time. It's it's fluctuated up and down so many times. And the whole idea that this uh, upward fluctuation is going to last forever and we can just, uh, uh, all of these different cycles are happening, but they're going to stop happening completely crazy if you think about it at all. So, yeah, I would point I out that when the earth was a molten ball in space, it had a, it had a climate. It was just <laughs> unbearably hot. That's so awesome. over 6 billion years. <laughs> but yeah. I, I would like to say, you know, I'd like to have a caveat there because there is no climate for the earth. There are climates all around the earth. There are different eco regions, ecosystems. A desert climate is very different from the ocean. It's all mm -hmm. one earth. It's all one biosphere, but there's no earth climate. There are climates and they all change on different time scales in different ways. Uh, and they have throughout history. I think I may have asked uh, Gavin Schmidt about this, that uh, what if um, they're talking about Earth would be uninhabitable if we got another two or three C warming from here. So what if we were exploring in outer space, we found a planet exactly like Earth, except it was three C warmer than Earth. Would we say, ah, dang, this one, uh, we, it's uninhabitable. Nobody could live there. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, of course, that would be crazy. But uh, this whole idea that we're right on the edge of, uh, of something terrible, it, uh, it's, uh, not, it's a non-starter. Can't well, believe. It's, cra it's yeah. crazy because when we evolved at a time, the earth was warmer when we evolved uh, it, we, and we evolved in a warmer region of the earth. You know, if, if you believe what the, the majority of scientists believe, they, they, you know, there's debates because the science isn't settled. But most scientists believe we came about around the equator in Africa and uh, it was a, during a warmer time period than now. No. Gee, we I do, survived. I do think it's really odd that I live, I'm sitting here in Minnesota. It's snowy right now. And the annual average temperature here is supposed to be about 46 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're told that if it warms by maybe 2F here, it's going to be uninhabitable here and life's going to be terrible. But right. we can go just a little further south in Iowa. Not, people aren't laying around dead in Iowa. They're doing just fine. So scaring Minnesotans, that's going to get a little warmer. I can't believe that uh, they even try saying that. It's, it's yeah, yeah, you know, Minnesota, one of the Min one of the best things that ever came out of Minnesota, besides your movie, is the Minnesotans for Global Warming. Remember that group? 
And they put together this fantastic parody video of Michael Mann and Climate Gate, which we've played here a couple of times. And it 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 was censored, you know, because no one can criticize man. You know, he, he's uncriticizable. He's perfect. So yeah, it it it's it's just it's amazing to me that people are so bent out of shape because you get more climate change getting on a plane flying from Minneapolis going to Miami than you'd ever get from the even the worst RCP 8.5 model. Hey, well, look, the majority of people, if, if they move when they retire, they don't move to uh, North Dakota or Minnesota. Uh, they move to Arizona, uh, Texas, Crossville, Tennessee, it turns out, and, and Florida. Right. Um, you know, you don't golf in snow very often. Right. Unless you're in the Air Force and you've done something stupid or bad, and then they send you to Nome. Yeah, There's no don't, place like Nome. People don't talk enough. I think one reason probably why the older folks move away from Minnesota is just when it's all icy everywhere, it's really dangerous for if you're 90 trying to get around in the winter here, it's extremely dangerous. So the whole idea, again, uh, of a little warmth being bad if you're 90 in Minnesota, it's, that's crazy. Totally crazy. Yeah, even in Illinois, I think it was my dad had a bad slip on the ice um, before they moved out of Illinois. And I think that was their last straw. <laughs> They said, nope, that's it. We're leaving. <laughs> that's We're done here. Okay, so another question. Uh, where are the download instructions? I'm not sure. That's a great question. You can contact me and I can help you download your own copy for now. We're going to have to figure out to how to make it more automated. But, uh, you know, email me or DM me and I'll help you out. Okay. Tom, what is your favorite part in the movie? Everybody's got a favorite part. What's yours? You know, for me, I think my favorite part was just the end when they're talking about how it is uh, in the big picture. We're not talking about uh, CO2. We're talking in the big picture that the whole thing is a war on people who have real jobs that are they're doing real work and they're providing the food and et cetera for everybody. And it's a war on them. It's a war on ordinary people. And there's so many of us and so few of them. So that that's my favorite part. I think he did a good job of uh, ending on a very important note there. War? What is it good for? Nothing. Uh, yeah, you can get a download out of YouTube, and there's different oh. uh, apps and things that let you download from YouTube and Vimeo. I think Vimeo allows a direct download, don't they? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I need to look at that YouTube one. I don't know what format you get when you download. I got to check into that. You might be able to if you have YouTube Premium. That might be... Uh, they They allow you to download some videos unless they have a block on it, but okay. uh, I haven't checked for that one yet. Good. Um, Man, thank you very much so far to our audience and stuff. You guys have some funny comments today. Uh, here's Zorro with, man is about as perfect as a broken record. <laughs> so. Yeah, right. The climate seems to be anomalously normal. Should we be worried? Oh, no, it's a crisis. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, you know... Um, we have been at this, all of us, except for Linnea, who's just started with the Heartland Institute uh, last year, um, or maybe it was the year before that. I lose track of time sometimes. But Tom and I have been in this for over 10 years. I know Sterling's been in it for over 10 years. You know, and we keep every day pushing back against this insanity. And it it, it is starting now, thanks to COVID. You know, and people going, wait a minute, you know, the science, follow the science didn't work out here. So maybe follow the science and climate change isn't working out either, especially when they're being told about, you know, doom and destruction and it's really not visible, uh, you know, in their everyday lives. And so I think, I hope we're making progress here. And I hope this movie will be a big part of the progress toward moving things back to sanity. Yeah, um, you mentioned something about not being able to see the crisis. I think Patrick Moore does a good job in his book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes, that there, since there's nothing happening where we actually are, they have to pretend that there's something terrible happening someplace on the other side of the world where we can't check it for ourselves. There's a ton of that. And just as an aside on that book, it makes me so happy that there's a guy in the movie, a Kenyan farmer, a brilliant guy named Jasper Machogu, and he was on the Greenpeace side and kind of an alarmist that maybe four years ago. And then he read Patrick Moore's book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes, and he realized that this guy, formerly Greenpeace, not believing in this, 
Uh, it really helped him to look into the data. And now he's solidly on our side. He's a very, very uh, good spokesman for, for Africa and for climate realism. So that's a heartwarming story for me. I also right. really, I like the parts where they talked about how the, um, the funding for science works, because that's something we run into all the time with climate realism. It seems like half of the stories that we cover are just someone tie, like kind of loosely tying or just vaguely mentioning climate change attached to some pretty much unrelated study. And then they just toss climate change in there to get some kind of funding for it. Um, and so that it makes the rounds in the media. But uh, so I appreciated that you guys covered that quite a bit. Yeah, so there's that whole incentive, like you just said, that you get highly rewarded if you push alarmism. And then on the other side, in the movie, I thought it was pretty powerful with uh, Sally Balayunas in there talking about how she was working with Willie Soon back in around maybe 03 or so and just uh, saying uh, uh, true things about uh, solar influences. And she got so much blowback. Her family got blowback. And she ended up uh, retiring early and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, getting pushed out of science. It's crazy uh, because she was uh, not... She was saying things that did not conform to the narrative. So it's uh, the incentives are just way wrong. And hopefully those are going to flip at some point here. I used to work with Sally and always wondered what had happened to her. I suspected that was the reason she was no longer doing it. There were some others that used to work with Pat Michaels that just stopped doing climate change because they got tired of the blowback and stuff. People who wrote books with him and, and articles, peer reviewed articles that won awards. Uh, that they are no longer doing climate research because it's like, yeah. you know, I don't need the I don't need the headache. So um, I do think. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I do <laughs> think the work. Do think the worm is turning in general? That uh, there's a strength in numbers, safety in numbers. More people are speaking out. Uh, I, I hear more people speaking out now than I did uh, three years ago, even. And I think it, it may, when it crumbles, it may crumble pretty quickly as uh, people realize it's kind of safe to step out of the shadows. Because I think there's enormous amounts of people right now today who know this thing's a total crock and they don't dare say anything. But I, let's, I hope, let's hope it people... crumbles like the Berlin Wall yeah. did. You know? Yeah. There you go. Really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of the Tom, you mentioned that a lot of these claims about disaster, you know, and all this stuff, people can't see for themselves because it's on the other side of the world. Well, I'm going to point out that there is one that you can see for yourself. In 1988, in a magazine interview, Dr. James Hansen of NASA uh, put out a prediction saying that the West Side Highway in New York City would be underwater in 20 years. So by 2008, it's going to be underwater. Well, 2008 came and went, and it didn't happen. And like these folks usually do, they can't admit they were just simply wrong. You know, they have to stretch it out. And so what Hansen did is, well, I misspoke. What I really meant was 40 years. And you can view this on my website at What's Up With That. We've got the story about it. We track these things. So not only were they wrong at the beginning, they had to do a cover-up on a new lie in order to make it not look bad for them. And that's the problem we've got with a lot of these climate scientists. They just refuse to admit they're wrong. It's so simple, but they won't do it because if they admit they are wrong, the money dries up and all their prestige and everything dries up associated with the research and the money and everything else. And that's really it. It's a thought of the money problem. So I do think a lot of the climate scientists now, they've wisened up and they're picking uh, end of the world stuff in the year 2100 or 2300. You got to pick some number, some year you're going to be safely dead and you won't have to, you won't have yeah. to uh, still be alive when uh, it's a. Uh, yeah, you won't be mostly dead. You'll be truly dead. <laughs> <laughs> I th but they're I, like, they're like, they're, they're becoming like politicians. Politicians say, we'll do this by this date. And often it's a date that they will no longer be in office, so they won't be blamed for either the bad results or the right. fact that it doesn't get done. I mean, Biden did it just this week with his new EV standard. When does the EV standard kick in? Well, conveniently, 2032. Uh, even if he were to win re-election, he'll be out of office by, for, by four years by then, so... I think I have heard about end of the world people and saying that the world's going to end at midnight on this certain date. So everybody gets together in a room and they're ready for the world to end. And the clock ticks midnight, nothing happens. And they say, oh, just kidding. It, it must have been a couple of years from now. It's that type of thing that they can't pick deadlines that are too close. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to the climate rapture. I got to tell you, <laughs> really looking forward to that. The only people that will be left on the earth are the climate realist like us. <laughs> All righty. So that who have to that, suffer through an extra degree of warming. <laughs> All right. Lydia, do we have any other questions to cover? 
Uh, I do not believe that we have questions except for engineer guy asking if anyone from the mainstream media even or Newsmax have reached out to you to talk about this yet. They have not yet, but uh, I'm hearing that they might reach out. So, yeah, I think it's going to happen, but not yet. All Great. right. On that note, then, I think we're going to call this a show. Um, I want to thank you, Tom, for joining us today. But more than that, I want to thank you and Martin Durkin for producing a fantastic quality piece of uh, cinematography. Uh, it really is going to make a difference. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing how it, it gets spread around the world. I want to remind everyone to visit our website, climaterealism.com, climateataglance.com, and energyinaglance.com. And also, climatethemovie.net where you can view the movie for free and, um, you know, get together a viewing party, invite your friends over, you know, invite your neighbors over and make them watch this movie while you feed them beer or something. That'll be a good way to get their, get their mind right. Okay. Yeah. And I want to, I want to give a shout out to uh, Tom Nelson's podcast as well. It's a really excellent podcast. He brings on guests all the time to talk about uh, different climate topics and uh, controversies. So please go check that out. All righty then. Well said, Linnea. Thank you. All right. For Sterling, for Linnea, and for Tom Nelson, I am Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute, wishing you a wonderful Friday and a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. See you later.